Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC Guy. Well, once again, we're right here at the modules because today we're going to install a programming truck right here on the model railroad. And what we're going to do is create a programming truck right here so that you can drive a locomotive onto the programming truck, do your programming, and then drive the locomotive back off again. And that way you don't have to pick up your locomotives and haul them off to your workbench and take the risk of damaging them in the process. So stick around for the video and we'll get started. Hit that little red uh, subscribe button and when the little bell comes up, click on it and click all. In a previous video, I showed you how to use a double pole, double throw switch in order to selectively provide power for running trains or for programming with your model railroad. And in that same video, I showed you how to use the NCE Auto SW, which is basically an automatically activated relay that will do the same thing as that double pole, double throw switch. And I'll put a link to that video right here above me and I'll also put a link to it at the end of the video. And that goes into all of the details about how to set up different types of programming tracks depending on the type of programming connections that you have on your command station booster. Because there are command stations that have individual mainline track and programming track connections, and there are many that are like the power cab that have one combined output for programming and main track operations. So take a look back at that video because what I'm going to show you here is the Aegis system and it has both a mainline track power connection and a service mode programming connection. So it separates those out for you and automatically switches between mainline track power and programming track power for you at the touch of a button. And we'll take a look at how that works in a few minutes. Before we do get started though, I do want to point something out to you. I've been working on the channel homepage creating more playlists because I wanted to add some playlists that would cover things like the power cab, turnouts, and other specific issues with a smaller number of videos in the playlist. So I've got several of them already created and I've got a list of others that I'll be adding to as I get time to do that kind of work. However, if you have a topic that you would like to see me create a playlist of, please add it to the comments and I'll add it to my list of things to do. In the meantime, let's go ahead and get started here with creating the programming track on the model railroad. Now when I was considering where here on the model railroad I would put a programming track, I decided I wanted it in a location where it would be easy for locomotives to access. But I also needed a piece of track that could be long enough to accept the longest of locomotives that I have for this module, which is going to be something on the order of about 12 inches for some of the longer ones. So my first uh, idea was to go back here to the loading dock area by the where the passenger station uh, will eventually be and where this locomotive is parked. However, that area right there just isn't quite long enough for all of the locomotives that I might use. In addition, I thought about this section back in here. That's a fairly long spur track here. And that's where the engine shed is eventually going to be located. So I didn't really want to put it back in there because some of the long locomotives might not be able to negotiate this S-curve and get into the engine shed and get fully isolated on the programming track. So then my attention moved to this track right through here because this is a very long uh, industrial spur for the gas works here that I've shown you in the past. And it has plenty of room in order for the longest of locomotives to get on here. So that was what I eventually decided to go with. Now, in order to create a programming track that's not going to be a problem, it has to be something that can be physically and electrically isolated from the rest of the layout. Because when you're doing service mode programming, it doesn't specify which locomotive is being programmed. It doesn't send the uh, programming commands to a specific decoder or locomotive address. 
it's anything on that truck that it's uh, sending commands to is going to be programmed. So you want to be able to physically and electrically isolate this entire section of track here. So the first thing I did was I took my good old Dremel tool with a cutting disc in it and I made a cut through each one of these rails. And you have to do both rails because you want to physically and electrically isolate both rails of your programming track. Then once that had been cut, that was not a problem at that point because as soon as the locomotive fully crosses over these two cuts, it's going to be isolated on this piece of track. And one of the things that some people might be concerned about is the fact that uh, it leaves a nasty set of, of cuts right here. Well, one thing you can do is take a piece of styrene, and this is 0 .040 styrene, and you can just insert that right in here, glue it in place with some super glue, and once it sets up, you can come back with an X-Acto knife and you can cut it to the shape of the rails and nobody will know that, uh, that those cuts have been made. Or, if you're not uh, concerned about the gaps that are created, I mean, they're no different than this gap here at the frog. One thing you can do then is just simply paint this and re the area, and it will disappear. The gaps really aren't a major concern, at least for me anyway. But if they are for you, you can use the styrene trick. So that gives me an, a track that is well over two feet long that I can use as my isolated programming track. Now, the next thing you have to do though is provide power to it because the power connections, the feeders that I had for this spur were located right here. And I had to leave them here because they provide power to this section of the rails and they provide power that goes way on back out here, the full length of this piece of rail. So those had to stay in place. So that meant I had to add a pair of feeders. So let me show you where I put those in. I decided to put these in a place where they're not going to be highly visible and it's hard to photograph them as a result. But right there, just to the side of my, uh, of my pointer, you can see where I uh, soldered a feeder to the side of that rail. And then I did the same thing on the other side. So I've got the two feeders that are going to go to the programming track leads. Let's go underneath of the layout and take a look at making the final connection under there in order to provide programming track power to this entire spur. Now this is the connection to the programming track. Now that I've made the cuts in the programming track rails to isolate it, and I showed you where I connected the two wires to the track itself, I'm going to go ahead and connect it up under here for the programming track. There it is. So that plugs in right there, and that's all there is to it. So let's go back up and uh, see how the programming track works. Now the first thing we have to do is turn on power to the Aegis system and the power cab. You can see everything's lit up. The power cab is starting up, so we now have a uh, connection to the layout. And I've got a locomotive here on the uh, layout ready to be programmed. Now the locomotive that I'm actually going to be working with today is one of my Southern Railway F3s, and it's number 4132. So let's go ahead and move it onto the programming track. Okay, so there it is on the programming track completely. And one thing you always want to make sure with this is that all of your wheels are fully past the gap. Because if you have your wheels sitting over the gap, then the programming commands that are sent to the programming track can actually get out here onto the rest of the layout, and they will reprogram every locomotive on your layout at the same time. So you always have to make sure get it fully onto the programming track, where it is physically and electrically isolated from the rest of the layout. And that's one of the reasons why I uh, chose such a long programming track here, because I wanted to make sure that I could get my longest locomotives fully past these gaps and onto the programming track. So that's a very important thing to remember. Okay, so now that we're 
fully onto the programming track, the next step is to go back over here to the Aegis system and switch it over to programming mode. Basically, you just move the connector to the programming socket and push programming. And you can see it switched. And if you listen, you can hear that the locomotive has power. Now that's one of the great things about the Aegis system. It does provide power to the track when you initially switch to programming mode. The rest of the layout has no power, so it's going to be separate from this. You're not going to be programming any of your other locomotives on the layout at the same time. But you can still run a train, or a locomotive anyway, on the programming track. And I'll show you why that's important in a minute. So we've already switched the track connections for programming. So what I want to do next is bring this up. I'm going to hit the programming button here. And then I'm going to hit, and you can see it says program on the main. We don't want to do that. We want to program on the programming track. So let's hit 4. So it says use programming track here. Okay, That's what we want to do. And you can go through the various types of programming that you can do. So standard is the standard set of CVs. So let's take a look at that one. So the first thing it's going to do is it's going to try to read the decoder. And it's going to tell you which manufacturer it is, 141. And this is a Soundtracks plug and play economy decoder. So that's the correct one. It's decoder version, I think 7.0 would be the uh, what that would be. And then we're going to move on in. You want to set up the address? Well, let's try that. Let's go yes. The short address currently is 03. So that's the standard uh, default short address. I'm going to leave it at that for now and move on pass. Uh, do we want to activate that? No. I'm going to leave it as the 4132. Now, you can see it has read that we're dealing with address 4132. So I'm going to leave that as well. I'm going to leave that alone. Um, we could go into and hit the configuration. And that's going to do CV29. So that would be the normal direction, forward or reversed. Okay. I'm going to leave it as normal. I'm, we can select whether we want 14 speed steps or the standard 28, 128. So I'm going to say enter, stick with that. And you don't want DC conversion activated most of the time. The reason for that is when you turn your set on initially or during a short circuit, the, the decoder in the locomotive can get confused. And it can convert to DC mode and take off like a bat out of hell. And the next thing you know, you'll be picking your locomotive up off the floor. But you don't, So you don't want to do that. And by turning DC mode off, then it won't do that. And then any time that you want to take it to somebody's house or the club and run it on DC, you can switch it back. But for normal purposes on a DCC layout, do not set your locomotive up for DC mode conversion. Okay, enter equals no. Speed tables, we're going to use the standard linear speed table. Uh, the address. Uh, we're going to stick with the long address. I don't want to set up the motor control. We've got that. Just leave these things alone. Now, what about other functions? Well, let's look at CV2. CV2 is the starting voltage. And this starts at zero. And you can use this when you're doing things like uh, trying to get a bulky locomotive to start at a lower speed step. So that when you go to speed step one, the locomotive will start moving. And to do that, you can increase this value. And what that does is it gives it a little bit of voltage initially at speed step one. And you might need to crank it up a little bit. Sometimes um, you have locomotives that have a fairly high starting voltage, and you'll need to give them a little bit more power to get them started. So that's what that's for. I'm going to leave it the way it is, because this one runs very well. And I went through all of these various uh, basic functions in a video that I did on the Basic 8 and on programming CV29. And I'll put links to that above me here, and also at the end of the video. So you can take a look at those. OK, so now let's go ahead and get out. I'm going to hit Escape. And we're back at the programming track. But 
One of the nice things is you can now work with the locomotive because it's got power here on the track. And I'll show you that. We can move our locomotive. If you change something like the volume of the horn or the bell, you can test them. And if they're still too loud or too low, you can go back into programming mode, modify the CV again for that particular sound volume, and come back out and test it again, all before switching out of programming mode. Now, just to show you one thing here, I'm going to back up and go across the gaps, and I'll show you that there's no power outside there. Because the locomotive, when it crosses those gaps, it's going to stop, because it doesn't have any power, as you can see. Now, in order to get it going again, I've got to push it back on here, and it will drive back onto the programming track. So this is one of the really nice features uh, of the Aegis system. It provides track power here on the programming track while it's still in programming configuration. And that allows you to test the changes that you've made to the decoder all before you switch back to regular main track mode and power the whole layout. So once you're done with your programming, just hit the button and switch back to main track mode and disconnect the power cab from the programming socket and move it to the main cab socket. And then as soon as the power cab powers back up again, the locomotive address will come back up, it will come back to life, and you can operate the locomotive. Run it back off of the programming track, out onto the layout where you can continue with your operations. So that's how you go about setting up a programming truck on your model railroad using the Aegis system and the power cab in order to give you an isolated programming track where you can program your locomotives without having to fear that you're going to reprogram everything on the model railroad because it is completely electrically isolated from the rest of the layout as long as you follow the steps that I just showed you. Well, that's it for today's video. So hopefully I've given you a pretty good demonstration of how easy it is to set up an isolated programming track on your model railroad. In this case, I've used the Aegis system, which really simplifies the process by splitting the programming track power leads from the main track power leads. So it sets it up so that you can switch easily between the two different modes without having to be concerned about whether or not you're going to program all of your locomotives on your model railroad. And that's a question that I often get from folks that are afraid that they're going to be doing that. But as long as you follow the procedures that I laid out, you won't have any problems with that at all. And the Aegis system makes it so much easier. And there are other ways to set up programming trucks on your model railroad, as I showed in the videos that I previously done on this, and I'll put a link to those on either side of me here at the end of the video, so that you can take a look at those and see which method best fits your current command station, or whether or not you want to pick up one of the new Aegis systems and go about it this way. So that's it for today. Have a great weekend, have a great week, and I'll see you here next week with another video from the DCC Guide. Bye now.